So welcome again to our Word Up Poetry Slam information session. We will begin by just talking about what poetry, what is poetry. Um, this is not going to be a session where I am the only person talking. So tell me what you know about poetry so far. Who'd like to go first? You can just unmute your mic and talk if you like. There are different, my name is Elijah Montout. There are different rhyming patterns in poetry. Um, the most common one, well, the most common type of poetry written is sonnets. It wasn't created by William Shakespeare, but it was made famous by William Shakespeare. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Anyone else? Poetry is using words to give off sounds, to express emotion, and to inform. Right. Okay. Um, so I have poetry is an art where special intensity is given to the expression of feelings and ideas by the use of distinctive style and rhythm, along with the implementing implementation of literary tools known as poetic devices and that's from digital poet 2015 and it began as part of an oral tradition and most times in the caribbean we get exposed to poetry as something written but like most writing like most text um began as an oral tradition okay and poetry is no exception it also began with the beat and negritude to um, poets. Sorry, the beat and negritude poets were devoted to the spoken and performed aspects of their poem. Okay, so you have poetry that is meant to remain on the page and poetry that is meant to be spoken and performed. And so today we're looking at poetry that is meant to be performed. It is believed to have its origin in pre-literate societies, where the oral tradition poems were recited, remembered, and repeated. And these were passed down through generations. And you have some really long poetry that you don't expect persons to know passed down from generation to generation. Performance poetry is diverse, and it includes a variety of, of different types of poems, like protest poetry, political poetry, stand-up poetry, punk poetry, jazz poetry, poetry fused with hip hop and rap, love poetry, angry poetry, deaf poetry, and so much more. And have any of you heard of any of these that I've mentioned here before? Nobody? Yes, miss, rap poetry. Yes, miss. Right. And it, it's interesting that a lot of, the, po a lot of the, the artists that you love and you know actually perform poetry. So we have persons like Jill Scott, I don't know if you know her, Alicia Keys, Kanye West, Lauren Hill, Erica Badu. All of these persons, or many of these persons, all of these that I've listed, actually participate in performance poetry. Now, the thing about poetry and performance poetry, as a writer, as somebody who is going to prepare to perform poetry, you need to be exposed to performance poetry. And so I'm going to be doing a bit of that with you today, um, exposing you to some performance poetry. So I'm gonna switch my screen. I apologize, I may have um, a couple of students coming in and out of here. I am at my school in our interactive classroom. So you may see a couple of persons walking up and down. I apologize in advance for this. Can you hear? No, miss. No, miss. Miss, can you give me a, a, a hand, please? They're not hearing. Hang on, I know when you're sharing, um, let me see that. When you're sharing, you need to click on something to do with sound. 
This is the share audio, the, the share as you, audio. you share. Yeah. Then, yes. Yes. So, Miss, look to the right of the share where you're choosing your share screen and click shared audio. Ah, uh, share sound. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear now? Yes, miss. All right. Good water, please, you a warm, Deb Forge, you're welcome to Miss Alicia Keys. <laughs> I'm a prisoner of words unsaid. Just lonely feelings locked away in my head. I trap myself further every time I stay quiet. I should start to speak, but I stop and stay silent. And now I've made my own hard bed inside this prison of words unsaid. POW, that's what I am. Not a prisoner of war, a prisoner of words. Mostly I say what you wanna hear. Could you take it if I came clear or would you rather just see me stoned on a drug of complacency and compromise? MIA. Guess that's what I am. Scraping this cold, hard earth for a piece of myself. For peace in myself. <laughs> It'd be easier if you just put me in jail, you know. If you locked me away, I'd have someone to blame. But these bars of steel are of my making. They surround my mind and have me shaking. My hands are cuffed behind my back. I'm a prisoner of the worst kind, in fact. I'm a prisoner of compromise, a prisoner of compassion, a prisoner of kindness, a prisoner of expectation, a prisoner of my youth, run too fast to be old. I've forgotten what I was told. Ain't I sight to behold. A prisoner of age, dying to be young. To my head is my hand with a gun, and it's cold and it's hard, because there's nowhere to run where you've caged yourself by holding your tongue. I'm a prisoner of words unsaid. Just lonely feelings locked away in my head. It's like solitary confinement. Every time I stay quiet, I should start to speak, but I stop and stay silent. And now I've made my own hard bed inside this prison of words unsaid. What did you think of this? Can you hear me? Yes, miss. Yeah, what did you think of this? I, I, I'm sure you know Alicia Keys, right? How many of you love Alicia Keys? <laughs> None yes, of you? Miss. A little mm. bit. I like some of her songs. Right. Okay. What did you think of this, though? It was a powerful performance, not just the words she used, but her, her body language. Mm -hmm. And even though she was sitting on a chair, it was impactful, right? Yes, miss. You felt it inside you. And yes, then you Mrs. Go ahead. It was like it. It didn't um, take away from the words she said. It more um, complimented the uh -huh. words. 
Exactly. And you felt the highs and the lows. And sometimes she got really quiet and she ended with a bang, right? Yes, miss. Okay. Let's go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. So... So spoken word basically is poetry that is written to be performed. Spoken word first kicked off in the American beat poetry movement that took place in the 1940s and 1950s. And spoken word can be delivered in a variety of styles and can, can involve a collaboration and experimentation with other art forms, including music, theater, dance. It can be used to tell your own stories or to explore stories of others. Spoken word performances require memorization, performative body language like gestures and facial movements, enunciation and eye contact with the viewers. Spoken word is, is characterized by the expression of emotion through the words spoken aloud. So it's about feeling that emotion that is being transmitted from the performer to the audience. The emphasis is on a voice and encourages the listener to focus on the, the voices in tone, their intonation, their inflection, their timbre. So the way the highs and the lows of, of the voice, where stresses are done, where pauses are done, all of that, and coupled with the emotions coming through all of that right? Spoken word poetry is intended to be an intense emotional delivery that may stay with you long after it's over. And that's when you know it's a really good one. When you're walking home after you've listened to it and it still resonates with you, you still hear certain words, certain phrases in your mind, especially those that are, rep are repeated, right? And this is the power of spoken word poetry. It is meant to be memorable. But as I said to you, we have lots of different types of spoken word. And what we're going to be focusing on today is slam poetry, which is basically what you guys are going to be doing. Ugh. Give me a second. I'm just trying to open my link. Once I switched from my computer to the computer here, I lost some of the abilities that I would have had in Microsoft. So um, I apologize. So this one now, is an example of a student like yourself participating in a poetry slam. So let's take a listen. I am a man. Please do not expect too much of me, for in the morning there will only be disappointment in its place. I am a man. I collect heartbeats and heavy breath like dollar bills while tossing I love you like loose change and receipt paper. I don't need that. You see, I am a man. 
I refer to you as the girl from the bar with the tongue ring because I will not be able to recall your name, your body. On the other hand, I will remember perfectly like I am the God who forged it. Your face is simply a memento safety pin to a space on my calendar. Your taste will be on my teeth until dinner time. The following day, I am a man. Torturer. New women from the snare of my lips while my tongue acts as a whip lashing my desires across her whip lash curves there there I call it slavery there I call it love there I try to say that I'm not like all the others because the history of women tries to tell them to rely on the words of a man but I I'm a split tongued two-faced master of language I am the cause with no regards for the effect I am a murderer a murderer with clean hands, but don't get me wrong, I don't mind getting down and dirty. My body count seems to hold more importance than my GPA in my room. You will find souvenirs and picture IDs in the drawer in the closet. There's dirty laundry that does not belong to me under my bed. You will find bloody sheets, a camera, memories to match, but no bodies to be found because they still walk the earth today. You see, they sit in classrooms, cry in bathrooms with my aftermath on their sleeve. The only thing they hate more than me is themselves. The only thing I love more than myself is the power that they are giving me so serial killer tell me how many there's been so far tell me why you thought it was okay to speak to her with tear gas on your breath and words drenched in gasoline tell me did she like it when you loved her with clenched fists instead of open arms tell me did you like it when you loved her with clenched fists instead of open arms tell me who declared you God who gave you the right to walk around wearing other people's happiness like dog tags? Tell me who declared you God, because you, you are nothing more than human. Nothing more than a mere man with faulty faith in an outdated value system. So don't you dare, don't you dare walk around all high and mighty like we could dig for gold in your chest like she was born to be at your feet. Don't you dare speak to her like target practice. Don't you dare love her like you know you shouldn't. Love her with no breaks, no airbags, just faith. Treat her like she is the last person on earth that you will ever meet. Speak to her like words are currency. You see, you, you are no man. See, men should not break more than they do build. See, men should not fight more than they do cry. You see, you, my friend, you are no man. And if you ever try to convince me that you are, I'd much rather be a fool. What about this one? How do you feel about this one? What are some of the things that you noticed? What are some of the things that touched you, moved you? What? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, miss. It's impactful. It's impactful, the words. Uh, first of all, the message to young men, it's impactful. And um, the different tonalities in his voice and the uh, tempo of how he said certain things mm -hmm. and the breaks he took in between right so you it, it became powerful because of the emotions that you you got out of it how he moved through the language as well as the language he chose the words he chose but how he moves through them when he paused when he when he got louder and and and, and you could tell that it was something that he was really passionate about, right? Yeah? Yes, miss. Yes, miss. And that's a, the that's a thing about slam poetry. It's a, it's a medium for you as an individual to talk about things that you're passionate about. If you're not passionate about the subject, if you don't understand the subject, if you don't feel the subject, then you won't be able to have the audience connect with what you're saying, connect with the words that you chose, connect with the emotions that you've chosen to talk about. Yeah? So let's yes, go back. Miss. All right, so let's continue. So slam poetry is another example of poetry which is very popular. It's simply a poetry competition in which poets perform 
original work alone or in teams before an audience. And sometimes this audience serve as the judges, while other times you have a group of persons who were selected to be the judge. And that is basically what um, Word Up Poetry Slam is about. You're going to have the judges who are going to react to your work. Um, the work is judged as much on the manner and enthusiasm of its performance, as well as its content, style, and so forth. Okay, it's not poetry that it, it, it's not going to be as impactful as if you read it, just read it from the page. It must be performed. That's what gives it its life and energy, right? So let us do this again. So this one is from 2017, 2018, another young poet. And again, we're looking for, we're looking at the characteristics that we see, we're looking for, we're observing, yeah? Pledge allegiance to your flag of the United States of America and to your republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for who? For you, for some, not for us, <laughs> not for our people. So please stop saying we equal with your flag of red, white, and blue in one hand. You beat us until we're black and blue with the other beat us until we're none beat us until we can't walk straight. Then you put us in chains if we lucky. But for the ones of us who are all so lucky, you tell us to put our hands up as some type of sick tribute to your privilege. And then you pull the trigger, pull the trigger until our bodies lay down on your ground. Pull the trigger until your clip is empty. Pull the trigger until we make your evening news. And then when our children cry, we have to look our children in the eyes and tell them that they have to be cautious. That when they walk your streets, they have to do so in fear that they have to spend an entirety of their life looking over their shoulder. Because you will hunt them down and you will bury them. Either run a prison system that aims to disenfranchise them or the dirt beneath their feet. <laughs> this is all because of that same racism that you love to say no longer exists, but we all know that that same racism is the reason that when we wanna put a hood on, we resist. The reason that when we go to get these jobs, we're dismissed at the door. The reason that when we go to shop, we're watched in your stores. That racism is the reason that us saying your Pledge of Allegiance feels a lot like a root canal or a whip's impact against our flesh or a baton to our head or a bullet in our back or tear gas at a Black Lives Matter protest. That racism is the reason that three women clenched their purses as I walk through the entrance of this very building, it hurts. That I have to remember that the system I was born into was built to work against me. Hurts that I have to remember. Hurts that I have to remember. Hurts that I have to Hurts that I actually have to remember that you will happily invest more money into the preservation of wildlife than you ever will into the preservation of black life. Let me ask y'all the question. When y'all turn on your TVs and witness another black body laid out on your concrete, what do y'all see? Another murder? <laughs> another sad story? Another funeral, do you see the aftermath? I see another child that lost their father. Another single woman trying to raise a man. Another broken home which leads to another child that grows up and suffers the same fate as their father. Which means another black woman that outlives her adolescent son. This country practices a culture that lacks equal rights for blacks. And we love to say that black don't crack me while y'all shatter our melanin like glass. My back breaks for every body you lay at our feet. For every memory I try to erase within your war zones. Late nights reveal that my PTSD has found its way to the surface. 
And my hate for this country reminds me that I'm far from patriotic, so it's a little ironic that I pledge allegiance to your flag of the United States of America and to your republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for who? Can you remember any line from this one? Any line? One nation under God of justice and liberty for, for who, I think. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Um, we like to say melan um, black don't crack, but you shatter our melanin, melanin like glass. Mm -hmm. Nice one. Anything else? Did you notice he repeated a line a few times in, in, in succession? Yes, Miss. Um, yes, Miss. And he kept saying that specific line with um, as though he was ready to cry. Mm -hmm. And that you felt the emotion coming out of that line. Yeah. Yes, miss. And every time he said that line, it was said in a different way. Did you notice that? Yes, miss. What do you think? What do you think was the, the purpose of doing that? Um to convey both um, many emotions from anger to sadness to despair. And usually when you want something to stay with the audience, um, one of the ways you do that is you, the use of repetition. Repetition is one of the poetic devices that you probably would have done with Mr. Hippolyte in his session with you. How, did you. Did you look at the literary devices with him? No? Okay. No, me, it's not from my recollection, All but right. he was okay. planning to have another session first. Okay, so in that session, most likely he would look at some literary devices. But, but repetition is one of those literary devices that I use very commonly and is a very powerful tool in order to help the, the audience remember certain things. Does anybody remember the word or the phrase? that he repeated so many times? No? Okay. So my advice to you is to look at, go online, just put in po slam poetry and you will get a whole bunch of examples that you could follow that you could listen to and see what devices that they're using how they're um saying their poetry what do they look like when they stand um how they carry themselves how they hold up their their their, 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 their bodies and all of that so poetry slam the structure of the traditional slam was started and constructed by a construction worker and poet Mark Smith in 1986 at the Green Mill Cocktail Lounge, a jazz club in Uptown Chicago with a reading series in Chicago. The competition quickly spread across the country, finding a notable home in New York City and at various cafes along across the United States. But the awesome thing about Poetry Slam is that it didn't just stay in the, in the United States. It made its way across the seas and across the land into Manchester, into England, and to, in a whole bunch of places. Mr. Mark Smith said, performance, in his opinion, revealed the genuine meaning and passion of a poem. It no longer is a dusty museum piece or stuffy scholastic exercise. It is life. It's immediate, it's vital. And based on the examples that I've shown you so far, can you understand why you would say that it is life? Why do you think it's life? 
Why would, why would someone say that poetry and slam poetry in particular is life? Because it speaks about things to do with like real issues, things that people can relate to, etc. Exactly. It speaks about everyday things that you go through. It is vital because it gives you a voice. A lot of the times we don't get to listen to young people. We don't get to listen. The, the words that come out of the mouths of young people are not important enough for certain persons in life. But this is an opportunity where young people can get to express the things that are affecting them, the things that they see. And sometimes, and I can tell you a lot of the times, it is amazing what young people actually see and know and experience and can talk about to have meaningful discourse on. And that, that's the whole point of Poetry Slam. It's an avenue for young people to get the voice that they don't normally get. A voice that a lot of persons quiet and silence. So this is going to be our last example. And then we're going to talk about some tips. Um, let me make sure I am sharing. What just happened? Miss, did I drop? No. Your hair. Okay. Can you see my video? Yes. Yes, miss. This one is for the girls. The other day, a young lady, brown as the melanin in my daughter's eyes, said behind a mic that she hated being a woman. She wanted to know what it meant to be one. I've often wondered the same, looked around for the teaching of such to tell me of myself. We all learn to be by imitation or indoctrination. Mama and media can't help but train, tutor us into carbon copies of themselves. So then knowing who we are or what we should be is really understanding whose costumes we wear on most days, whose skeletons we switch with when Adam took his nap. I was told a woman was independent, autonomous, that she needed not a man or moon to keep her in orbit that she moved about as wind and breeze, lived without needing permission to interrupt all that is still and under restraint. I was told a woman cannot truly be herself, that is, if herself is not light enough, dark enough, if her hair is no Rapunzel replica, or if it be too underground railroad for those cotton acting men to stomach. I was told that my body is neither belonging of me nor its beauty innate, but that I am not gorgeous unless told by another woman's son to be so. When did the mouth of men in whose image women are not made and begin to damage us so silently? Maybe it was when we began believing the voices that have no deity in it. I was told a woman should not submit, should not be meek, that that type of behavior was only for women who treated their voice like a secret. I was told not to be a secret, but a siren. To be as machete as I can and honor my opinions at the expense of respect. While some men may believe themselves to have liberty over a woman's body as taught how to destroy as only depravity could predict. We have equally learned how to tear and rip and undo dignity with a mere sentence or squint. It's called strong by society. They tell us that's what a backbone looks like. But beautiful is the spine that remembers where it came from. That lets its knowing of self not be determined by every wind of doctrine and dust, but God himself. We must unlearn the deep misunderstandings that compose themselves as empowerment, as freedom. Liberation has never come by way of unbelief. Eve did not attain life by finding beauty in lies, but only a naked body and a husband that forgot her first name. We women must be smarter, must be wiser, must be bent on loving truth. No matter how contradicting it is to a dying culture, I tell you, a woman is no fool unless she chooses to be if you ask me what is a woman I would tell you that she is a bone made alive with distinctions that set her apart as does the difference between a firefly and a new poem 
A woman is not a man. Her calling is not a synonym of inferiority. Her distinctions are not the child of patriarchy. They come from a creative God. Did you see his fingerprints in your hips? The whistling shadow of his mind when your body became home to another name that called you mommy where all the gladness you forgot could exist. A woman submits to her God, her husband, her church. She is no weak-willed or brittle-backed woman, but only as strong as humility and faith may identify her to be, they say. Submission sounds like servant. They say, that sounds like something to rebel against. I say, ain't it funny how being a servant is repulsive to everyone but God and we wonder why we can't recognize his face if you ask me. If you ask me, what is a woman? I would tell you that she is a sister to all. Even those whose blood is not of the same roots but who was still as kin as her mama's firstborn, and she treats these sisters like a wintered quilt, making sure her mouth does not unstitch that which was made to keep cold hearts warm. We are made up of nurture and everything comfortable, and that is why we feel so deep, why we cry so sudden, because the emotions that make us woman don't make us unstable, but turn us refuge to the chaos where our ribs once sat. We are necessary yeah. and nuanced at best. But a woman should be nothing more or less than what God made her to be. If you asked me, what is a woman? I would tell you, ask the God who made her. How was that one? I actually like that one. It was thought provoking. Oops. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry. Uh, let's try that again. Go ahead now. It was thought provoking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Did you notice I how? Go ahead, Eli. My favorite line, well, one of my favorite lines was about um, when she said, just now if I can remember the exact words, um, we, um, something along the lines of, um, we don't like service and we wonder why we can't find God's face or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the only person who knows anything about serving is God or who thinks that serving is good to serve somebody is, 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 is the almighty. Um, did you realize that this one may not necessarily has well, may not necessarily have been as, as forceful as the others, but still just as impactful? Did you notice that? Yes, Miss. You don't have to shout to get your message across. You don't have to be all heavy, and it's about sometimes just about the words and and the impact in the quiet is also important so to be soft to be quiet is just as impactful as to be loud and to be rough and to be raw i don't know if that's the right word yeah so you can get impact with a varying impact with varying techniques that's the point so Now, come on, screen, do your thing, disappear. All right, so in 1990, the first National Poetry Slam was held on October 18 in San Francisco. There were four person teams from Chicago and San Francisco and an individual poet from New York. Um, the Chicago team won the, the competition and an individual called Patricia Smith won the individual competition. So you can have it in groups, you can have it in as individuals. I think this poetry slam that you guys are going to be taking part of in is a individual competition, but I'm just giving you information as to, you know, the possibilities and how um, slams work all across the world. 
Um, the SLAM movement crossed the seas to other continents, even small islands like ours. And in 2004, Young Identity was founded in, in the UK and became a, a big thing where you ended up having what we, they called the World Cup. So it's like the World Cup, but for poetry. So it happens every four years in Manchester and you have poet, poets from all over the world, your age, and sometimes even younger, working towards a performance. And just like you, they would be um, paired up with mentees and they would work with persons who are more experienced in themselves. So my advice would be to gain as much information, as much knowledge from the mentors that you are going to be given as you can, because it's a very, very valuable experience. Not only students from St. Lucia benefit from, but how it's done all over the world. In 2008, we saw a poetry slam dedicated simply for women called Women of the World Poetry Slam, and it was held in Detroit. And these are just examples of where slam poetry was, where slam poetry is going. And so we get to the important, or well, the most important parts of my presentation. How to approach writing your slam poetry. So Masterclass 2021 says, make sure that you are tackling something that is important to you, that is that you feel strongly about, that you can generate feelings for. It says to write a gateway line, come up with a gateway line. And a gateway line is a line that is like your poem's thesis. It tells the audience what you know sorry, let the audience know what you're going to be talking about. So when the young man, the first, was it the first young man? The second young man said, I am a man. That was his gateway line. We knew exactly what he was going to talk about, about being a man. We may not have thought that that was where he was going to go, we may not have known exactly what aspects of being a man that he was going to talk about, but we knew what he was going to talk about. And so that's what your gateway line does. It tells us, it tells everybody, it tells your audience what your subject matter is going to be about. And the rest of the poem is going to be spent reinforcing, supporting, and expanding on that initial idea. You're going to use all the devices, you're going to use the words, you're going to use your imagery, you're going to use your expression, you're going to use your, the sound, the tone of your voice to be able to support that idea. So the, the, the next idea is to focus on sensory details. You want the audience to be right in the scene with you. Like when the young man used the word class, and your melanin became that glass that was shattered. It created pictures in your head. It created images. I can just imagine a glass being shattered by a ball or something. But in this case, that melanin is being shattered by what? By guns, by violence, by police brutality, by a whole bunch of things. But that image of shattered glass was like so vivid. And that's what you want to do. You want to use sensory details and those sensory details you're using your hearing, your voice, the images that you, you would see, maybe even describing something you would feel. These are sensory details. In some poetry slams, you have persons actually using their mouths to create sounds that they want the audience to engage with. So they actually create sounds. Um, some persons use beatboxing. I don't know if you know what that means, where they make the different, the music out of their mouths. No, I, I, can't, make, I can't do one for you, but I'm, I'm sure you, you, you've seen a movie or something with, with the guys making the sounds with their mouths. All of that is possible, all right? So what you write, you want the audience to be seeing, to be hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling, 
through your entire piece, using the literary devices like metaphors, similes, irony, personification, to make those connections for you, to make those comparisons for them to be able to see. We've already spoken about repetition. Repetition is an important part of, of poetry and you have to use it very wisely. You don't want to repeat just anything or everything. You want to repeat things that you know you want your audience to remember because repeating certain lines or words in a piece can emphasize an image or an idea for your audience. Repeated lines have the same staying power in a person's mind long after you've gone. And remember, you want to create an impression with the judges. So in the three minutes or the two minutes that you're on stage, the judges have to be able to connect and remember, you have to be memorable. And repetition is one of those tools that can help you achieve that. Wordplay is, is also used often crafting a clever mix of pictures and feelings and sounds. So how you mix your words together, how you pair them up, how you, what types of words, the, the words that you use, you must be specific and deliberate in selecting your words. We good so far? Yes, miss. All right. Yes, miss. Great. The next thing is to make it sound good. Right? The way the poem itself sounds is just as important as the content of the written words. Poetic devices like onomatopoeia, alliteration, and assonance are ways to introduce more rhythmic feels, feeling, sorry, to the words that you write. Okay? So including sound, how it moves, how the sound moves through your piece. And we will talk a little bit more about that in a little while. So set your poem aside for a while. Once you're finished with it, then revise it. Give it a week, give it two weeks, come back to it. Sometimes you would realize that you want to change some things. It didn't quite make you move you the way it did when you first wrote it. And you want to adjust some of the words that you have. If your poem does not move you, it's not going to move anybody else. Try it out on your friends. Try it out on your parents. See what they think, what they feel. Try it out on somebody you know will give you their honest, honest opinion. Yeah, there are some persons who are not really poetic, don't know anything about poetry. Don't go to one of those and you, and you, you, you know, you pour in your heart out for them and they look like you're like, what are you trying there? And that kind of thing. So revisit it after a while. The next thing you need to do is to... Give me a sec, huh? Watch others perform. And that's basically what I did today. Give you some examples that you can see and hear. You see how they use rhythm, how they use structure, how their voices sounded, how they alternated their, 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 their how they modulated their voice. How they, into, how they used intonation, when they were silent, when they were forceful, when they paused, all of these are important. And you're only going to, you're going to expand your experience by watching others. And I'm telling you people, YouTube, have it. Go on YouTube, put in poetry slam, put in deaf poetry, put in put in some of the things that you would have gotten from this PowerPoint and you will see so many things you're going to be absolutely blown away. End with an image. Your conclusion should wrap up your story for the audience. Leave them with a lingering thought or feeling. It could be one of hope. It could be one of pain. It could be a lesson learned. However you decide to conclude your piece, it should be tied within the message of your whole poem. It's almost like writing an essay with imagery and sound and all of that, it's the same structure. All right, so things to pay attention to when you are writing your poem, rhyme. Rhyme is basically the repetition of syllables, typically at the end of a line. And a lot of poets like to rhyme. It's not necessary to have rhymes. If you're going to have rhymes, let it be for a purpose. Let it be for a reason. Select the words that you're going to use well, so that it, it creates a certain image, it creates a certain feeling. You also have internal rhymes. 
And that's the rhymes that you may have within the sentence or within the, the, the stanza. And that's again, you do that for a reason, okay? That, that sound creates a, 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 a pattern and image for you as well. We also have rhythm, an audible pattern in verse established by the intervals between stressed and unstressed syllables. And that's more technical. Um, that is something that you would do if you're delving into a little more into the structure and um, more structured forms of poetry like sonnets, like you, you mentioned earlier. So you have stressed and unstressed syllables and different types of sonnets have that, different types of poems, more formal poetry have that. And you can use it as well in your piece, but it's, it needs to be something deliberate, okay? And the other thing is the poetic devices. Poetic devices are anything used by a poet, including sound, shapes, rhythm, phrases, words, to enhance the literal meaning of their poem. Um, this YouTube video I have there is one that looks out, um, that looks at the literary devices. So, so you can look at this one in your free time, or you can just go on YouTube and, type in literary devices or poetic devices and you will get a range of stuff um, with examples, okay? The things to pay attention when performing, um, we also look at a poem. Yes, it's about the poem, but the audience will not leave, have the poem in front of them, reading it, reading it over and over. If you've been in an English B class and we're doing poetry, you would, your teacher would tell you something like, never read a poem once before you start to, you know, when you're engaging with it, always read it about two or three times. But the audience is not going to get that opportunity. And that is why your delivery of the poem must be impactful. The words that you use, where you stress, what you say, or how you say it must be impactful. And so you need to keep in mind posture, and that's how you stand, how you hold yourself. Do you remember the, the poet with the bag on his back? Yes, Miss, the one about um, I pledge allegiance to your flag. Right. Did he stand upright the entire time? Does anybody somewhat, remember? Miss, somewhat, but he had his head like, he had his upper torso somewhat slanted towards the audience like he's patronizing them in a guarded right. manner. So this young man used his body. He was kind of sl slanting on a side. There were times he had his hands behind his back, showing you basically what it would be like if you were in handcuffs, for example, right? It also demonstrated an idea that he cannot stand tall and powerful because of that oppression that he's experiencing. And so his posture and his body language was important in conveying the message that he was trying to convey. The voices, how the voice is used is important in conveying that message. If it's a somber message, it's, you cannot come and, and express a somber message with shouting from the, from the top of your lungs, your entire piece is not going to, to make the audience feel what you want them to feel to make the audience experience what you want them to experience. And the facial expression is so important. Your face can't just be a blank canvas just there. It also must express the things that you want to express within your piece. What are the words are you saying? How can you express that with your body, with your voice, with your face, with your pace? How fast or slow when you speed up, a lot of times when you listen to some performance poets who have not really thought about how they say their poetry, it almost sounds like a song. And every poem that they come up with sounds the same way. It's almost like they're singing. And there's nothing wrong with singing if it's deliberate, if it's being used for a purpose. But for me, as, as, as a poet, as a performance poet, I like using singing in my pieces. I think that's, that's me. That's what makes me stand out. Um, and so it's possible, right? But it has to be something deliberate. It has to be used for a reason. 
it can't be just done because you want it to be done. Yeah. So the main rule of, of slam poetry is that poets are not allowed to use props, costumes, pre-recorded taped music, musical instruments while performing. And that's the difference between slam poetry and spoken word. Um, in spoken word, just general spoken word, and like I said, there are a lot of different types. Like for example, jazz poetry or beats poetry, and you can look it up. It, it, it occurs where poetry is said using music over a beat, right? For slam poetry, you cannot do that. The only beat, the only thing that you are about allowed to do is to use your voice to make whatever sounds. So you can do the beatbox, you can do the singing, you can do whatever sounds. Some persons just make sounds with their voice, but it's incorporated into their poems and it's done for a reason. So you cannot use anything else and you cannot, whatever outfit you're going to wear, for your poetry slam, it has to be something that you would wear throughout. So it's not about costuming and props and, and all of those things. Any questions? Uh, miss, for me, my memory is not that to 